Hi, I'm Matthew Sudell and I'm the host of PPN Knightsbridge. We're a property networking club. We meet once a month at the Royal Thames Yacht Club in Knightsbridge and you can find dates for our future events online. The club is emptying out now, but just half an hour ago, this room was full, packed of investors listening to Jim Mellon's presentation. Those that already know of Jim Mellon will know that his reputation is one of the highest out there. He was in Hong Kong making money when China was booming, then he was in Russia. He predicted a credit crunch and that in fact, he wrote a book about how that was coming. Um, he also called Brexit right. I gave Jim a complete free reign to talk about anything he wanted to. Jim's a sophisticated investor. He invests in many asset classes. He's got a substantial real estate portfolio, but he also invests in pharmaceuticals and many other asset classes. Jim chose to speak about the new age to longevity. We don't always film our speakers, but uh, the tickets for Jim sold out two or three weeks ago, and we thought it made good sense to film this and release the video. So just for you guys, Here's the video of Jim's presentation. Thank you very much, Matthew, for the introduction and having me along today. Uh, I will start by giving you a little flavor of where I think property is going. Um, in the, the broad macro context of the world economy. Now, we saw a picture of uh, Donald Trump's uh, Trump Palace flat. I can tell you because I've had inside information on the subject that it's 30,000 square feet, which is just an unbelievable quantity of space, probably bigger than this club maybe twice the size of this club, and that's his, that's his flat. And uh, he lives there with his wife and uh, his son, Baron. And um, he doesn't drink, as you probably know. Famously, he doesn't drink, but he does like fast food. He believes that American processed food is the only healthy food uh, because it's been through a factory and it's been boiled and you know uh, processed in a way that uh, is not going to give him any germs. So when Nigel Farage, <coughs> Famously, the first politician to visit Trump Tower after Trump was elected uh, went to Trump Tower. Uh, Nigel, being a man who enjoys uh, a free bar or any kind of bar, uh, was a bit uh, parched when he came out of there because the only thing on offer is uh, fast food. There's buckets of Kentucky Fried Chicken, Big Macs piled up, and uh, Jack in the Boxes and all that sort of stuff, but no booze. So after he met with Trump, he came and uh, had lunch with um, my sister, who's sitting here, and myself and a few of our friends in New York, because we happened to be in New York at the time. And I can tell you that the lunch was the most expensive I've ever hosted, to the point where my credit card uh, was declined, because <laughs> it was such a, an expensive lunch. And my poor sister here uh, had to fork out for part of it. She has been paid back, at least I hope she's been paid back, uh, and that's my Donald Trump story. Now, Donald Trump is self-described as a master of the deal, and he has made his money, and I assume he's got quite a lot of it, although the amount is uncertain. He's made his money by using what is the best attribute of real estate and also its worst, which is leverage. And uh, so everything in terms of real estate depends on your ability to get leverage and your ability to time that leverage cyclically so that you don't borrow at the top of the market and end up having to liquidate and being wiped out because equity goes very quickly and it goes before uh, bank debt, as some of you, all of you, will know in, in this room. So everything is about trying to time the cycle. Now, in broad terms, I think that in the United Kingdom, we're going to do quite well out of Brexit. You can already see that the stock market is reflecting a more optimistic tone. It's risen sharply since... Uh, since the middle of June and, and the referendum last year. Uh, the pound has adjusted. It needed to adjust. It was uh, overpriced. And that will be helpful in terms of attracting foreign buyers to the UK property market. But there are some headwinds, one of which uh, is, of course, George, George Osborne and his tinkering and his imposition of really punitive rates of stamp duty on the property market uh, in the UK. I think that that, that stamp duty will be watered down, maybe even taken away, because it only raises 2% of gross government revenues. It's not an important part of government revenues, but it's very important in terms of the friction costs of people uh, moving houses and, um, and the general health of the property market, which is very important to the UK economy. So my, my own view is that that will no longer, or in the relatively near future, will be removed and will be, or at least adjusted downwards, and will be a positive indicator for the UK property market. But there are some other indicators that are not so positive. One is the 
ratio of property prices to average incomes, which still remains very high in the UK. Uh, the second is the reluctance of banks to lend, and the LTVs um, are still not not as good as they were, um, and uh, they're, they're still an impediment to property prices. And the third is that the outright price is quite high on a per square foot basis if you look relative to replacement cost excluding the imputed value of land. So uh, my main asset, I've made many mistakes by the way in property. I have two hotels in Blackpool that I bought on the basis of it being the fracking capital of Europe, and uh, it's not, and the hotels are still there and uh, not particularly successful. Do you go to Blackpool? It's a lovely place. Uh, I bought here in London, I bought two flats uh, a year and a half ago, right at the top of the, of the market, but I had to have somewhere to stay. And uh, so I've made yeah, many mistakes in property, but my, my best ever investment in property was in Germany. And uh, we have uh, quite a lot of flats that we rent out. I'm not, I've got none for sale. I'm not an agent. I've got nothing to sell, so I'm not going to be kicked out by Matthew for promoting anything here. But I want to tell you on the what basis I bought those properties. The first was that property ownership in Germany was very low 13 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. The second is that the value per square foot of buying the properties on average was around 40 pounds a square foot. That was the purchase price, not the rental. Uh, the third is that gross rental yields were 10% with 25% voids. And the fourth was that the demographics, excluding the refugees who came to Germany last year, were very positive. And um, so we, uh, and Although we couldn't get huge leverage on it, thank God, we got reasonable leverage on it, and it's been a very, very good investment. And I would say that Germany remains a good property market to explore if you're prepared to venture outside the United Kingdom, because home ownership is still relatively low compared to the UK, but the Germans have got nowhere to invest their money, because interest rates are either negative or extremely low. So they're looking at property. The banks are a little bit more savvy in terms of uh, lending now. The Germans are not nearly as sophisticated as you guys here in terms of the British property market, so you can probably use your superior knowledge of how property works and how to make it work in Germany better than they can, despite the language barrier. Most people speak English in Germany uh, uh, anyway. Um, and the demographics remain very favorable in Germany, and of course the cost is much lower per square foot. It's above replacement cost, uh, which it, it wasn't when I bought 12 or 13 years ago. Um, but it's still way lower than it is here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think it's an attractive place to, to have a look at property. And the yields are you know, maybe a little bit lower than the UK, but there's a lot of reversionary potential. Rents are going up. Um, and I think it's an interesting place for uh, you to possibly have a look at. But the best feature of German property is that the euro is definitely going to break up. This has been my clarion call for the last year or so. The reason why I was pro-Brexit was nothing to do with immigration or sovereignty. It was all to do with the problems of Europe. Europe is in deep, deep uh, crisis. And the euro zone, the common currency, is the main reason for that crisis. And I'm sure it's going to break up. Now, it's very hard to know where to have your money uh, in, in the circumstances. Do you have it in an Italian bank? No, because probably you'll be bailed in and your money will be taken away from you. <laughs> All right. Do you have it in a Cypriot bank? Obviously not. Do you have it in a Spanish bank? Where do you put your money so you can be safe in the event that the euro breaks up and that the new currencies that are going to be strong, particularly the new Deutschmark or the new uh, Dutch Gilder or whatever it is, the strong cur currencies of northern European states, will reflect um, an, up an uptick uh, based on the, on the euro uh, breakup. And the best place to have that money, in my opinion, is in very short dated German government bonds. Very short dated, because otherwise you're dinged for negative interest rates. Or German property. So if the euro breaks up, the new Deutsche Mark will go up by 50% against the, on day one, by the way, against the uh, Italian <coughs> currency or the uh, Spanish currency or the French currency. And you'll have a, an immediate uplift in uh, currency value as a direct result of the breakup of the Eurozone, which is going to be the major fault line of the world economy along with China for the next few years. So watch out for that. And of course, there will be no negotiation about the breakup of the Euro. There will be no sort of Brexit-style uh, ruminations and, and uh, strategies and all that sort of stuff. It will just happen because the Italians one day will announce to the world or the Greeks or whoever it is that they are 
leaving the Eurozone and they will have a new currency that's already printed and that will be the way in which they, it, it, it will happen. There'll be no pre-announcement of it, but it's going to happen. Sooner or later, and I would say sooner, so sometime in the next one to five years, you'll have a breakup of the Euro. And that's why I would say, have a look at German property. That's my contribution as far as property is concerned and the broad macroeconomic outlook um, uh, for uh, this evening. Uh, and if I was going to invest in UK property, I'd definitely be looking at Birmingham because the rail, rail link is going to be very quick um, and Birmingham may even become a commuter zone and Birmingham to me seems like the best place to invest in UK property at the moment and I'm actually actively or we are actively having a look at that uh, as we speak. Now, I am a kind of uh, plagiaristic investor and when I started work, my first boss, Richard Thornton, was a member of this club here and I can tell you this was a long, long time ago. It hasn't changed at all. It's exactly the same, down to the carpets, the seats, and everything else. And I think the barman upstairs is exactly the same barman. Nothing has changed. And that's a, probably a good thing. Um, but Richard Thornton, who sadly died last year, uh, was uh, an original and inspirational investor, and one of the first British investors to invest in the emerging markets. And his company, uh, GT Management, is now called LGT, and it's a very, very big... Uh, fund management company uh, investing in all the frontier markets and emerging markets around the world. And his main motto was, I think it's a quote from a Shakespeare play, was that a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of a small mind. And by that he meant that you have to be very flexible and change your mind depending on circumstances. You have to, on one day, say, I like IBM shares, and on the next day, I hate IBM shares. You have to weigh up in your mind with flexibility what the best investment opportunities are and act on them. And I always think that there are three keys to uh, investment success leading on from that. One is curiosity. And it's really good to see people here today who are in the property business about to listen to someone who's going to talk about the new age of long longevity, which has some implications for property, but they're kind of wild and they're fairly tenuous and they're they're way out there in terms of time. But we are all human beings, and I think everyone is interested in longevity. So curiosity marks out the first of the three legs um, uh, of success. The second is adaptability. And adaptability is really important in the modern world because everything is changing so quickly. You've read the stories about how half the world's workforce is going to be made redundant by robots and automation and artificial intelligence and so forth in the next 15 or 20 years. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but nonetheless, it's the way that things are going. Taxi drivers will be no longer taxi drivers in 10 years' time once we've got autonomous vehicles. And by the way, they are coming. Bus drivers will be gone. Truck drivers will be gone. A lot of uh, basic white-collar work, basic legal stuff will be gone. And the reason why the City of London will lose employment is not because they're going to move to Frankfurt or to Paris or to Dublin. It's because the whole industry is automating. So people in the city are going to be made redundant, not because of uh, a Brexit, but because of a fundamental shift towards uh, automation. So you have to be adaptable. You have to understand that in your lifetime, young people's lifetime particularly, you're going to have to do several types of jobs. You're going to have to move from one job uh, to another. And the third and the most important is application. There is no easy way to get rich. You have have a modicum of luck. You have to have a decent education. You have to be curious. You have to be adaptable, but you also have to work. You have to work at it. And so what I do when I'm interested in a new area, something comes to my mind, is that I write a book. Right? Maybe people won't read the book or buy the book. It doesn't really matter to me because you don't make any money by publishing books unless you're the Harry Potter author or something along those lines. Right? There's no money. If you write your book on property, you probably won't sell that many copies and you, you won't make a living out of it. But what it will help you to do is to organize your thoughts and organize your strategy and think more deeply about what you are proposing to get involved in as an investment strategy. So I, first book with my co-author Al Chalabi came out in 2005 and was about the coming financial crisis, which I think was pretty obvious to a lot of people. There was a kind of, it was a car wreck in slow motion. Uh, and we have another crisis that's unfolding at the moment, which is another car wreck in, in uh, slow motion based on this very expansionary policy of central banks around the world, but that's for another time, and your best insurance bet on that one is to hold gold 
and silver and anything in the precious metals complex as a partial insurance against that. Inflation's coming back, all right? So that was the first book. And then I wrote books about how to invest and how you, know, you would go about researching investments and what sort of investments, including property, would you be looking uh, to make. Uh, and then we wrote a book on new technologies uh, a couple of years ago. And about three or four years ago, we wrote a book on biotech, which has been an area of very great interest for myself and my colleague, uh, Anthony Chow, who's here today and has helped me prepare these slides. And now what I'm really interested in is longevity, because longevity changes everything, all right? The science of longevity is a very new science, because until relatively recently, people just didn't live very long lives. And it is a fact that the first pension scheme introduced in the world was introduced in Germany by Chancellor Bismarck in the late 1800s for anyone over 65. Now, less than half of 1% of the population lived over 65 years. So having a pension in those days was a sort of like getting the Queen's telegram a few years ago on your 100th birthday. It was a very unusual event. Now today, how do we support these many millions of pensioners at the age of 65? Because if you don't make it to 65, something's gone seriously wrong in your life. You've had an accident, or you've smoked too much, or you just had an unfortunate <laughs> genetic trait, but almost everyone is going to make it over 65 years old. And how can the world support this aging population? It's a very major issue. So in Japan, by 2050, 40% of the population, right, that's nearly half the population, will be over 65 years old. What are they going to do? Who's going to pay for them? And that's at the same time as there's a lot less children in Japan and around everywhere else around the developed world to support all these people. So longevity is a new fact, and it's going to get even more interesting because, yes, there's lots of centenarians. Yes, there's lots of old people. Yes, there's lots of um, people who are making it to life expectancies that even 50 years ago were almost unheard of. But there is still a fundamental barrier to the age at which people live currently, and it's around 120. That's the kind of maximum lifespan that human beings can make it to for reasons that are not entirely clear. There is a sign, however, on the airport, on the road from the airport in San Francisco, which is the epicenter. It's actually, that's the wrong word for San Francisco because it's also the earthquake capital of the world, potentially. So it, San Francisco is the center of technology around the world, as we all know. And there's a sign uh, devised by a guy I'm going to talk about very briefly called David Sinclair that says, the first person to live to 150 years old is alive today. And I believe that. I think that's the case. And if we can make it to 150, what's to stop you living to 200, 300, 400, and 500? Which is why every single one of us should take account of the fact that we live in an age of technology that's not just potentially there, but is actually there that is going to dramatically expand human life's life expectancy and is also going to change the fundamental way in which we live our lives. And that's the basis of this uh, talk that I'm going to do today. And I've got a few slides here, and I'm going to go through them relatively quickly. If anyone wants a copy of the slides afterwards, please ask Anthony Chow, who's sitting at the front here, for that. And if anyone wants more detail on this, ask him as well. And, um, <laughs> and he'll Google it. Um, right, so basically, if we very briefly divide down my talk into three or four parts, the first is the theory of aging and longevity. As I said, people weren't really interested in aging and longevity until quite recently because people just didn't live that long. But today's technology, that is the technology that we have today, and I can see, will allow a 20 to 30 year life extension, i.e. to around 150 at the maximum limits, just by the process of current science. But the real holy grail is, why do cells age and die? There are immortal creatures out there. There are things on this planet that appear to be immortal. There is no pre-programmed death within us. We don't have to die. What is the reason why cells age and die is going to be the 
focus of huge amounts of money, huge amounts of scientific research, and huge investment opportunity. And that's why I'm writing this book. It's going to come out sometime at the end of March. And the implications for the world economy and investors are totally and utterly dramatic. Now, sitting here in the Royal Thames Yacht Club that hasn't changed for all those decades since I first came here with my first boss, we have a sense of continuity. Everything seems to be the same. Yes, we'll all go to school at five, we'll leave at 18, we'll go to university, we'll start work at 21 or 22 years old, we'll retire at 65, we'll go to the nursing home at 80, we'll dribble with medication until 85 or 90 and die. That's the pattern of existence today. That's about to change dramatically. And take note that this is the biggest thing, this is the most dramatic thing that's happening in the world today. Brexit, forget it. Donald Trump, forget it. It's what's happening in science, not the frivolous science of Google and Snapchat, which are symptoms of scientific advancement, but the real science that's taking place in places like Boston, Cambridge, Oxford, San Francisco, which are dramatically going to alter the lives of all of us in this room. Right, so our ancestors, the original ancestors, they had, as this, guy, this, this man's talking to his friend, had clean air, pure water, plenty of exercise. They ate organic food, and yet no one lived past 30 years old. Why is it that we now have an average life expectancy, if you're born today, of somewhere between 90 and 100, and 50% of children born today in this country uh, will live to over 100 years old? What's, what's happened in that time to allow us this dramatic increase in life expectancy. Well, what is aging for a start? Aging is the process of accumulating junk in your body, basically. So cells that go senescent and are not cleared, uh, cells that are damaged uh, beyond repair and your body just can't keep up with the repair, uh, that causes aging. And aging is the cause of almost all disease in the world. So when you look at diseases, regard them as diseases of aging for the most part. Of course, it's not every disease, but most of them are diseases of aging. And diseases of reduced metabolic functionality, reduced mitochondrial activity. Mitochondria are the, um, the cells which, uh, the part of the cell which uh, create the energy that we all depend on. And it's the largest risk factor in uh, almost all diseases. Now, we have and the reason that people died at 30 maximum in prehistoric times is because they couldn't counteract the diseases that came as a result of aging. Now, we've got band-aids and plasters that we can put on those diseases. The invention of penicillin is a good example of that. The uh, sanitation that came to the fore in the late 19th century is another example of that. The understanding of transmission <coughs> of bacterial and virus-borne diseases, uh, the treatment of cancer, the treatment of cardiovascular diseases. These are all 20th century inventions going now into the 21st century. And although aging still exists, and we still have metabolic junk, and we have more of it in some ways because we don't live the clean and pure lives that the prehistoric people did, we can now band-aid those diseases that are the result of aging, and we live much longer not necessarily better, but we live much longer as a result of that. So it took four million years for human beings to increase their lifespan from 20 to 31 years old at the expected uh, date of death. And in 115 years, we added another 41 years on top of that. So in a very short space of time, science, technology, understanding took us from 31 to 72 by 2015, this is worldwide life expectancy. In the developed world, it's a higher life expectancy. And by 2050, we can reasonably posit that we'll be at 120 years based on current science. So in the relatively near future, we're going to be adding one year for every year of life of expectancy. So if you live another year, you can expect to live another year on top of that, just as a result of scientific advancement. And that's despite the fact that human beings are doing everything they can with their lifestyles to degrade that scientific opportunity uh, that they have. So there's dramatic increases in life expectancy. 
But nonetheless, we still come up against the upper age limit, which is 120. Now, if you look at the reasons why people died in 1900, they're very different to the reasons why we die today. Infections, influenza, and pneumonia, tuberculosis, diarrheal disease were the principal causes of death. And today, it's heart disease, cancer, uh, and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, both of which, all three of which, rather, are the result of both aging and lifestyle. And so the longer that you live, the more likely you're going to get these. And with um, the, the fact that we've got antibiotics and we've got much better sanitation, these have gone way down the scale in terms of what you actually die from. Interestingly, uh, pneumonia still ranks quite highly because old people tend to get pneumonia uh, after falls and in hospital and so forth. So that's still a very big uh, cause of death. But the causes of death are changing and they're much more related to how old you are rather than to what a shit life you have with lack of sanitation, lack of antibiotics and, uh, and so forth and, and poverty basically. But at some point, everyone dies. Everyone dies. This is the oldest woman in the world. Uh, she, she was the oldest woman in the world when she died. And she was 122 when she died. She's called Jeanne Calmont. She died in 1998 in France. This was her 117th uh, birthday party. And on that date, she gave up smoking. <laughs> she did. All right. Now, this guy uh, died at, I think, 149 years old, according to Indonesian records, but Indonesian records aren't necessarily very accurate. But there is no one in recorded history uh, who's lived longer than these two. And Methuselah is a figment of the Bible, uh, which in itself is full of figments and fictions. Um, and uh, so this is the upper age limit. And really none of us, I don't think, want to either look like him or be like her uh, in our dotage. So everything is about transforming our old lives into being elderly rather than elderly. And a lot of medical science is devoted to that today. There is a correlation between size of animal. Mice don't live very long. And the size uh, of, uh, and, and the lifespan. So we are quite big. We're not as big as horses and elephants. Uh, but we still live longer than them. But the correlation isn't perfect. But generally speaking, the higher your heart rate, the, uh, the faster you're going to die. It's a kind of rate of life expectancy. It's not a perfect correlation. There's a lot of science going into this. Um, but it's one way of looking at it. The faster your heart rate, the faster you're going to die because you're using up heart heartbeats. It, it really isn't an accurate reflection of modern science, but it's one way of looking at it. It gives you a broad overview of how long you're, you're going to live. But immortals do exist in nature. I don't know if you know this, but there are creatures out there. Most of them are, they don't have sex, all right, because sex is a very, very burdensome thing. <laughs> Reproduction has a huge burden on life expectancy. Uh, they did a study in the 1950s when you were allowed to do that sort of thing on psychiatric patients in America, and they castrated a whole load of guys. And the guys who were castrated lived much longer lives. Um, and uh, if you neuter a dog, for instance, it will live significantly longer than an unneutered dog. So the, the reproductive burden, and that takes the form of cancers, reproductive cancers, prostate cancer, cervical cancer, etc., cetera, um, are significant in terms of our average lifespan, but there's also a tremendous amount of energy expended uh, in reproduction. So the animals that tend to, or organisms that live immortally tend to be self-replicating. They don't actually have sex. They just do it themselves, basically. And, uh, but there are some. There are some, like lobsters and sharks, that appear to be immortal or potentially immortal if they weren't, uh, they weren't, uh, they weren't hunted or they weren't eaten or whatever. Um, and they could live uh, forever, and they do have sex. So there are immortal uh, beings out there. And the big trick of science today is going to be to discover why they're immortal and how we can apply their techniques for being immortal for us being immortal. Because as you know, DNA in every living organism on this planet is more or less equivalent. And we're only 1% different to a mouse. We're only 2% different to a, to a pig. And we're only 3% different um, to, uh, to dogs. There's very little dif that, that differentiates us from other living beings. So if we can find out why these ones live forever, or apparently forever, or could live forever, 
Maybe we can apply that to where we are uh, and, and see if we can't become in some way or another immortal. And Ray Kurzweil uh, had, has posited that by 2045 we'll have just that as a result of computing power and as a result of the accumulation of knowledge. But in order to get to that point where we have the potential, if you want to be immortal, if you want to be immortal, we have to stay alive to get the benefit of scientific advancement. And the advice to stay alive is very simple. Take the right pills. And if you want to know what the right pills are, take a mini aspirin every day if you're over 40 years old. That's a 75 or 81 milligram uh, aspirin. Take 500 milligrams of metformin, which is an anti-diabetes drug. It scours the, it's called glucophage. scours the body uh, for sugar. Absolutely everyone that I know and I talk to among the key opinion leaders in this space are on those two uh, drugs, and there are some others which I'll talk about in a second. Drink red wine. Teetotalers live four years less than people who drink. It's true. But of course, you can go over the top, which is why I'm on dry January at the moment, because I was over the top at Christmas. And then eat plenty of uh, fruit and vegetables. This is a statement of the obvious, right? And then exercise. Exercise three or four times a week. Doesn't have to be for a long time, it has to be pretty intense. But if you exercise, you're likely to stay alive to get the benefit of all this scientific advancement. And if you think about it, you know, age is just a number. Uh, we all have very different phenotypes. We all have very different epigenetic effects on the way that we are. And if you look at some people, you can say, well, they're 40 years old, or they're 60 years old, or they're 20 years old, and you might be dead wrong, because we all affect the way that we are by our lifestyles. So what you don't want to do is to do what this lady is doing or has done, and you certainly don't want to be taking non-prescription, sorry, prescription opioids, because the reason that the life expense in the US has begun to go down, believe it or not, the first country in the advanced world in which there's been a reduction in life expectancy is because 55,000 people last year died of overdoses on opioid prescription drugs, which are the real scourge of the United States at the moment. And it's a, a disgrace to the pharmaceutical industry. But of course, they're all, I say all, there's a very high percentage of obesity. Smoking remains a, a, a no-no. And if you want to live a long life, 14 years off your life if you're a, if you're a, a smoker of more than one pack a day. And, um, and the food industry isn't helping either. So we have scientific advance, but at the same time, we have our own lifestyles which are contributing to uh, a reduction in the potential lifespan that we could be having. And of course, as I said earlier, the older you get, the more disease you get. So old people tend to have what are called comorbidities. People in their 70s normally have two or three diseases, including diabetes, arthritis, uh, cancer, and heart disease, all of which are the direct result of aging and, uh, and screwed up uh, metabolisms, uh, and uh, uh, all of which, if we could understand why aging occurs and do something to reverse it in themselves, could be cured. So at the moment, what's happening is that we're trying to cure all these diseases, and in many ways, we're succeeding. But what we should really be looking for is why aging is occurring, why the cell is aging, and trying to reverse that. And that's what's happening right now. So genes that are damn regulated with aging, and otherwise, uh, the, the, the good genes that we want to have uh, more of are uh, such things as mitochondrial and metabolic pathways, uh, immune systems, DNA replication, and so forth. And they're down regulated as we age. And if we could find some way of up regulating them, you might not age at the same rate. In fact, you might not even age at all. Aging is extremely complex, but the science today is sufficient to take us 20 to 30 years extra lifespan. And here are some of the things that the promising approaches given current science that you might want to have a look at. Uh, target of rapamycin, very interesting pathway. Nic nicotinamides, telomeres, you've probably heard of telomeres, they're the little ends uh, at your chromosomes, and as they get shorter, you're more likely to die. Cellular senescence, the junk that's in your body. Uh, and then, of course, sugar. Sugar, IGF-1, insulin resistance, uh, is one of the biggest killers in the world. Uh, at, the, at the moment, and if we could cut down sugar, cut it out, there would be a tremendous um, improvement in people's health and their potential for living. Aging is not evolutionary, it's cell exhaustion. There is no pre-programmed necessity for us to die. So, 
everything that we're looking at today in terms of the reason that we, the first cohort on the planet, that is a, a, a sort of population group on the planet, can expect a significant improvement in life expectancy is not prayer, it's not going to church, it's not uh, some elixir that some guy is selling off the back of his horse-driven cart. It's because of the discovery of DNA, the phenomenal improvement in computing power, and the understanding of the human genome by uh, Crick and Watson in the 50s, and subsequently the unveiling of the human genome and the Human Genome Project. All of these factors are the reason why today we live in a world where we can anticipate living much, much longer than our ancestors. And if I said to you, I can make you live 50 years longer, and I could prove it, most of you would sign up to the Jim Mellon uh, company and, and spend 10, 20% of your income giving you, me the money in order to make you live 50 years longer, because we all really want to live longer. I flew in today from Berlin, and I flew right across the Shard in, on a British Airways plane, and I thought, what a beautiful view uh, that is, and I want many more years of that view. And we all do. We all want to live longer, right? That's, I think it's a given. But I can't prove to you that I can make you live 50 years longer. So we use models, or the scientists use models, which are fast growing, have very strong DNA affinity to human beings, uh, and have short lives so that we can genetically change them and see what the effect of changes on their DNA is in terms of their life expectancy, their quality of life, and then try and apply it to human beings. And those four models are yeast, believe it or not, the mouse, which as you know, there's many millions of mice being experimented on all the time around the world, the earthworm, uh, and the fruit fly, which is a, an old stalwart of scientific research. And all of these breed very quickly, so you can introduce genetic mutations into them and see how you can extend their lives. And the scientists that we talk to can typically extend all of their lives by between 30 and 50 percent and extend the quality time of their lives as well by a comparable amount. But none of them can work out why, even with all those genetic <coughs> mutations, they can't be transformed into something immortal. And that's going to be the real trick. That's going to be where the real money is made, where the real scientific advance is going to be made in the next 10, 20 years. These are some of the pathways that are being looked at by scientists around the world in order to improve uh, life expectancy. This is the 20 or 30 year edition that I'm talking about at the moment. Rapamycin uh, is the, uh, and, and, and its pathway, the target of rapamycin is one factor. Nicotinamide is another factor. I'm not going to go through this in any detail. You'll be very pleased to know, but all these slides are available. Nicotinamide, uh, in, in, or NAD+, plus, a version of nicotinamide, improves the um, stimulates SIR2, which produces sirtuins. You may have heard of sirtuins, which generally decline with age, but are very important to uh, reversing arterial dysfunction, uh, lack of fertility in, in menopausal women, and so forth. This is a very, very exciting area. And there are companies involved in this which will be going public, which will be the new Googles, the new Apples, the new uh, really exciting companies that all of us will have an opportunity of investing in at an early stage if you're curious, adaptable, and you put your work in to finding out which ones they are. These are telomeres. I've mentioned telomeres earlier. Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel, Peace, uh, sorry, Nobel Biology Prize three or four years ago, was the first person to discover them and how important they are. Uh, we, we want to have longer telomere, telomeres, uh, but if we have too long telomeres, we have too much telomerase, which is the the, 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 the product that can immortalize human somatic cells, then uh, we can also generate cancer. So there's a balance between the two. So it's not just as simple as that. And there's Mr. Hayflick, who's still alive, who's worked out the number of times that cells typically can divide before they die. And he's working, even at the age of 89 today, to work out why the, there is this limit and how the limit could be overcome. So all these programs are going to take some time to come to fruition. But in the meantime, life expectancy, apart from the United States, poor white people, is generally rising. Diseases are being knocked down. You probably know that HIV is now a controllable disease. Hepatitis C is curable. Cancers are being cured by immunotherapy and other forms of advance. 
an arterial disease with, first of all, the statins, uh, the beta blockers um, are now being reduced in terms of their severity. And there's a new class of drug called PCSK9, uh, which is a form of statin, but a much more potent form of statin, which upregulates good cholesterol and downregulates down, down bad cholesterol, which are the principal causes of arterial disease uh, and look incredibly uh, promising. Personalized medicine, you've read about uh, genome sequencing, that price has come down to about $1,000 per whole genome. And very soon, in clinicians' offices, GPs' offices, there will be a sequencing machine and your own, at least part of your genome, will be sequenced uh, as a matter of course. And very soon, GPs, many of them, we put out of business because of the IBM Watson, uh, the artificial intelligence computer, with an algorithm and a nurse that will do a better job of diagnosis than any GP can do at the moment. So medicine is going to change dramatically as a result both of computing, accumulation of knowledge, uh, and uh, the sequencing of the human genome. We'll have organ replacements. We'll be like classic cars. You'll go and have a new heart. You'll have a new liver. You'll have a new uh, windpipe. You'll have a new uh, lung. That's coming very soon, and they're going to use pigs or scaffolds uh, populated by your own stem cells to produce those organs. And of course, then there's genetic manipulation. And many of you will have heard of CRISPR-Cas, which is the new form of gene editing. Uh, this, was, uh, this is part of biology, that basically uh, bacteria fight off viruses by using this CRISPR-Cas mechanism. Uh, and some people in various institutions have worked out how to use this to both take out sequences of, of DNA, parts of DNA, and introduce other parts of DNA into sequences. It has good and bad applications. It could be used, for instance, to create new diseases that, for which there is no cure, uh, pandemics, for instance. But it can also take out orphan diseases, such as muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis. And it can be used to treat cancer. This is a, a new technology. It was only discovered in 2012. It's a subject of lots of patent disputes, but there's huge amounts of money going into this area. And I can tell you now that CRISPR-Cas9 is the first iteration of it, and now CRISPR-CPF1 is going to be an absolutely phenomenal uh, industry. This is going to be something that you'll look back on and think, wow, this is as important as the discover of, discovery of penicillin in 1928 and the first introduction of penicillin in 1941. It's already being used, and it's going to be very important to life extension. So watch out for this. Now, there is a number of important people who, in this industry, and because we're writing a book, uh, they're more inclined to talk to us than just if we came off the street and said we're interested in investing in their company. So Anthony, my colleague, has met Aubrey de Grey. I've met David Sinclair, and I'm going to San Francisco next month and meeting the rest of these people. Uh, I spoke to Laura Deming. All right, Laura Deming started at the age of 12 in the University of California in San Francisco in the most important um, anti-aging uh, longevity clinic with um, Cynthia Kenyon. She was there at 12 years old. She'd already done her uh, undergraduate degree. She was a postgraduate at the age of 12. She's now 22 years old. I spoke to her on the phone the other day. Uh, why someone of 12 wants to be involved in anti-aging or longevity, I've got no idea, but <laughs> she does. And she's very, very, obviously very impressive. And these are the people who are driving this new industry. And bearing in mind, this is the industry that's going to affect all of us, every aspect of our lives. Uh, this is super exciting. So I'm going to get to meet these people. This is Dr. David Sinclair. He doesn't look like that at all now, because he's developed this compound called NMN, which is not on the market, but I assume that he's going to try and commercialize it through his company, Hydra. And he takes that along with metformin, and he's gone from being looking like that to being pretty stick thin. And his blood sugar, he's 50 years old, has gone from that of a 50-year-old down to that of a 28-year-old. And sugar is a very, very, very important uh, indicator of uh, aging. And this guy is the most cited scientist. He's also a super nice guy, scientist uh, in anti-aging and longevity. This is not quack science. This is real science. This is something that's going to affect all of us. This is Aubrey de Grey, and I'm afraid this is really the way that he looks. He is the sort of Gandalf <laughs> look-alike. And he is the one who's really come up with all the stuff about how we are just, we are, we're aging because we have too much junk, too much 
rubbish in our systems. And he's working on how to get rid of that junk. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the cellular senescence, which is the, the, the word for all that junk. And the first person who can work out how to take senescent cells out of your body, that's cells that are neither dead, apoptose cells, nor working cells, but somewhere in between, a sort of limbo. If you can take those out, life expectancy will increase quite dramatically. So what are the implications, very briefly, of increased lo longevity? You won't go to school, as I said at the beginning, at the age of five. You won't leave school at 18. Life will be a continuum of learning. We will have to learn all the time, which is a great thing. We should all be learning uh, all the time. You won't necessarily get married and have children. Why would you have children at 30 if you're going to live to 150, 200, 300, 400 years? So the world's population will shift. And already the world's population is beginning to show signs of tipping over in terms of numbers. And I do not believe that we're going to end up with 9 or 10 billion people. I think the world's population is going down. The fertility rate of women in the developed world is way less than the replacement rate and has been for a long time. And now it's the same in China. And it's going to be like that in India and possibly in the future uh, in Africa as well. And what are we going to do? All right? We're going to be in a world of consumer abundance. Goods are going to be made by robots extremely cheaply. So what are people going to do all day long? Well, they may just play video games. They may have uh, incomes that are guaranteed by the state. Uh, we have no idea what people are going to do, but the shape of our lives is going to be completely different. It isn't going to be prescribed. It isn't going to be, my dad was an accountant, I'm going to be an accountant, uh, and my children will be accountants as well, or doctors or lawyers or whatever. We'll all have to do different stuff. And we're going to have to change continuously to stay ahead of the curve. Get back to curiosity and application uh, as well as adaptability. So there's the guy uh, with his early version of uh, virtual reality in a different world because he has so much time on his hands. And I do believe that this is going to be the biggest challenge, is what are people going to do with the abundance of consumer goods, because they're going to be made so cheaply, and this excess of time. And the best thing to do is to develop your own interests outside of property, outside of making money. Uh, and. Uh, just keep on being curious and look for new stuff to do, basically. Now, these are some companies that most of which, to be honest, are, um, are, are private, although Sangamo is actually public, um, and most of which are in the United States. But you can invest in some of these. Some of these will come to market. Get a copy of the list from Anthony if you want to. Uh, and some of these will be huge companies, and some, like many startup companies, will be gone in a matter of two or three years. Uh, there's a lot of money going into CRISPR, as I said uh, earlier on, and um, there's going to be a lot more money going into this field because there is no one on the planet who doesn't want to live uh, longer and doesn't want to live a worldly as opposed to an elderly life. Now, in terms of application, I think one of the best things that you can do is to read. And in this area, these are the things I read. Um, but in uh, general, reading 20 or 30 magazines of all types every week, newspapers, columns, internet stuff, except for the fake news that Donald doesn't like. Um, that's what you need to do. You need to read. You need to be constantly engaged. You need never to stop doing and never stop not being curious, basically. So there's early stage investment opportunities in this. None of them are mine. I've got nothing to sell. Uh, but I want you to watch out for it. Uh, and if you're really interested, I would go to the Master Investor Show here in London on March the 25th which is going to have lots of companies, that, some of which will be involved in this area. Uh, the current technology is going to keep us to 120, but it's the future technology I'm really interested in. Uh, and very soon, we'll see one year of extra life for every year of people on the planet. The biggest breakthroughs are yet to come. And once I finish going around the States next month doing the interviews, the book will be finished. And uh, hopefully, you'll pick up a copy of it. All the pro profits go to charity. So and it's going to be called Juvenescence. Juvenescence, the new science of living longer, doing things differently, and making some money out of it to pay for it all. Matthew, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So the, the background to me inviting Jim to speak when I finally managed to get his commitment, I said, Jim, what are you going to speak about? And you were actually, I think you were in Hawaii at the time on a, on a quick whiz around the world. And he said, the new age to longevity. I said, sounds great. What's it about? And he said, wait and see. And I, I, I was actually very nervous about you coming to speak because I know that you're obviously a master investor and you invest in many asset classes and I know that you're a big biotech and pharmaceuticals investor as well. 
And I was hoping, especially as my wife is here and lots of Auckland's investors are here, that you weren't going to talk down real estate and that I wasn't going to walk out of here single with no business and nothing going on. So I was, I was kind of quite nervous. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, we've got, um, we've got time for one or two questions before Jim has to get to his next engagement. Uh, I know we've got some doctors and surgeons in the room. If anyone's brave enough to throw a question. Oh, Jesus. That's a bit worrying. <laughs> the, the good news is, actually, you've probably done my property business the world of good because a few of the people in this room are actually trying to buy care homes with us. <laughs> Hi, Anthony. What's your question? Hi there. I hope you don't mind. It, property seems frivolous now that you've uh, talked about all this. Um, can I ask a property question? Property law, interesting. Well, we we'll have to live somewhere. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> So, um, oh, how am I going to say this? So, basically, uh, I'm a fan of yours because you predicted the crash. I'm a fan of Peter Schiff, who also predicted the crash. And your books read like history books when you read them, and they were written before the crash. So, uh, thank you for that. So, uh, Peter Schiff says that um, the, the interest rates are going to go up and be forced up uh, because of the bond rates. And I don't understand the, the relationship between bond rates and interest rates. And I wondered if you could just briefly explain that, why central banks will be forced to raise interest rates because of the market. That's my question. I know it's a bit so boring, but... Uh, no, no, at all. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it, it's, it, very fact, important. it's very important because uh, property is keyed off uh, the rate of interest. Now, uh, one of the reasons interest rates are going to go up is because they have been printing a lot of money. And the way that they print the money is basically by... Uh, buying bonds, right, with newly created money, all right? That's what they've been trying to do is to force the bonds out of hands of institutional investors or individual investors, that those investors will then take riskier bets, that they'll then say, well, I've got no more bonds, uh, what am I going to get a yield on? So I'll, I'll invest in companies or I'll invest in <coughs> property or, or whatever. And that's why you've got a bit of an asset bubble going on in the stock market, and in some areas in property is because of this government quantitative easing where they're basically buying up as many bonds as they can with creative money to generate speculative asset bubbles in the hope that somewhere it will trickle down into the real economy. And they also needed to do that because they needed to recapitalize the banks that were very badly placed after the crash of 2008. Now the European banks are not fixed, generally, the UK banks are probably fixed, and the American banks definitely are fixed. So you can see in lending uh, patterns in the US, lending is going up quite dramatically in the United States. Banks are back with their animal spirits, their balance sheets are recapitalized. Here in the UK, you're beginning to see an upturn in lending, actually. Um, and we, we uh, have a small bank, and uh, we can see competition for lending, which is a good thing, right? Okay. But all of it is generating inflation, inflationary pressures. So. Inflation is coming back. Now, in the early stages of inflation, it's not good for property because governments are going to continuously try and dampen down the inflation by raising interest rates. It's the only cure that they have for inflation is raising interest rates. And even I wasn't um, a kind of you know, functioning fund manager in those days, but we did have interest rates up in the 15, 17% levels in this country um, in the 1980s, all right? And that was basically because inflation was getting out of control. There's a possibility that inflation could get, I wouldn't say out of control, but could rise much more dramatically than people think here in this country, partly due to the depreciation of sterling, but much more importantly due to the printing of money that's been going on in the last six or seven years. So I would say that in those circumstances, you want to be a little bit wary about jumping into property because if interest rates go up, you might find that your assumed cost of financing that real estate uh, would be actually higher. Uh, and also the general economy will be under pressure because of the rise in interest rates. People may not be able to pay their rents. Companies in particular may not be able to pay their rents to the same extent they can now. But it also represents a huge opportunity because at some point in interest rates will max out and that's the time you want to go out and you really want to buy as much property as you can. I can't tell you when that's going to be, but there's a cycle there. And uh, we are entering a rising interest rate cycle, which in the initial stages is not good, sorry, Matthew, for property. But in one or two years may just represent a huge and fantastic opportunity. So don't be over leveraged going into this period. And if you can get interest rates locked in for long periods of time, if you can lock in interest rates at these currently very low levels for 5, 10, 20 years, I would do it.
So you'll be relieved to hear that most of the people in the room, if they are investing in property, are not just doing straight buy to let, they're doing really aggressive income, high yielding, producing serviced accommodation, HMOs and things like that. But it's a very good question. This will be a good one. Philosophy graduate from Cambridge, David. Uh, that's right. I went to one of Lord Breed de Grey's uh, talks a couple of years ago when he was head of genetics there. Uh, and he was promising that anybody in the room at the time who was uh, 60 years old could, could, could look forward to a lifespan of about 1,000 years before they got run over by a truck or whatever. But I noticed that since then, he's sort of downgraded the expectations, so now you've got to be 40. So kind of, what realistically, you know, because uh, you're talking to all these guys, what realistically are, are the current figures? You know, are they likely to downgrade a bit further? My expectation is that the 120-year lifespan expectation is 10 to 20 years away. And one of the key factors in that will be the uh, quantum computing which is going to break the logjam of computing power that we have at the moment. As you well know, uh, Moore's Law has come to an end, and Denard's scaling has come to an end, and Kreiker's Law has come to an end. So basically, we're at a, we're at a logjam in terms of computing ability, and that needs to change. And I think quantum computing and Google, IBM, are really close to getting very good working quantum computers, which will accelerate this process, actually. So as far as Aubrey is concerned, well, Anthony had um, uh, tea with him in... Uh, California, what, two weeks ago, or maybe less than two weeks ago, and uh, Aubrey was spooning the sugar into his tea, so obviously he's not, no longer believing in, in what he once believed in. Back in 2008, uh, when they started the um, uh, printing money, uh, the quantitative easing, everyone talked about inflation then and just wondered why you think it hasn't happened yet, because it's like nearly 10 years later. It's, it's a very, very good point. And the reason is because... Um, to, in order to get inflation, you need money times velocity. You can have all the money in the world stacked up in this room, but if we aren't out there spending it, moving it around the economy, then there's no inflation. Money uh, times velocity equals inflation. So too much money chasing too few goods is the definition of inflation. All right? But if the money's not chasing anything, and the banks aren't lending, and we're not spending, and we are frightened to spend, our animal spirits are gone, then you don't get inflation. But those animal spirits are coming back, and the banks are lending once more, and the components of an inflationary fire are there now. Not in 2008, but because they printed so much money, the fire, if you imagine that's the, tin, the kindling for the fire, there's a lot of kindling, and there's a lot of wood piled on top. When it does get going, it's going to be pretty big, basically. Thank you. Okay, this, we're going to have to knock it on the head. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Jim Mellon. Thank you very much, Jim. Fantastic speaker.